so on this on this thought of immortality, um, let's talk a little bit about Logan because I how much affection do you have for Logan? Like you've, oh. he's been such a part of your life for so long. It, it's like, I can't imagine how you must feel for him because my affection for him is unbelievable, right? Like mm. he's not even real. And yet I feel an affection for him the way I feel an affection for you. Now explain how that's possible, right? Like you're a real person. You are my friend. I have affection <laughs> for you. Logan is a character and yet I feel for him. I weep for him. Yeah. I, how is that possible? That's a really, that's a great question. I think there's something archetypal about the character. I'll go back to my personal connection with it, but it's a very archetypal character. It's been the basis of many, the outsider, the reluctant hero. He's a mixture of where we want to be. Well, most of us want to be. Like it, that's why he's so cool, and I wish I was Wolverine, and marches to the beat of his own drum, and and yet he's imperfect too, which is so important. Completely imperfect, so yeah. we can relate mm -hmm. in that way. Um, I have such a when you act when you're acting, you have to fall in love with the character. You've probably heard that before, it's, but you, you sort of do. You have to. Even if you're playing, you know, Macbeth, if you're playing someone who murders the king because he wants to become king on any level, yeah, this guy's a monster, right? But the, that's where Shakespeare's brilliant. You get inside his head, his ambition, and you can see it coming. You see his failings. It goes without saying every character I've played, there's some level of love or affection. But with Wolverine, I've, I, I felt at the beginning like he was teaching me. It's going to sound weird because... I'm a people pleaser and he's the opposite, right? Hmm. He he almost to his own detriment is an outsider. I'm desperate to be an insider. I will do whatever I need to be to be on the inside. And so playing someone who is the opposite was so, so great for me. So kind of relieving and fun. And it, it was difficult. It was not a particularly happy set. I didn't feel comfortable for quite a long time. I didn't feel I really had... Uh, the support on set in in just the very first one the, just the first one okay which was what year was that 2000 99, 99. we were filming okay. and i was you know someone else was playing the role do Grace scott had the part then he got injured on another film and that film went over so they had to recast so i was sort of like i got cast they were shooting it was their third day of shooting and i was coming to do an audition on set so i was a, a bit of a last minute thing I could just feel a bunch of people like, ah, oh, we had the guy, like, who's this guy? And then I just don't think I found my feet for a while. I was trying to, I was came from the theater. We, we rehearsed, let's work it out together. And it just wasn't that. And, and I felt very much on the outside and I actually thought I was going to get fired. Um, pretty reliably uh, felt that I was close to getting fired and, and the humiliation of that. I remember spending a weekend talking to Deb and I was just bitching to her about this person, that person, you know, this situation. And she actually said to me, she goes, mm, babe, I don't think you've done enough work. I said, what? She goes, I can, I understand why you're angry and probably a bit embarrassed and scared, but it sounds to me like you actually, you haven't done the work. Like, and a real, wow. I spent all that weekend and I went, Oh, that was, that's another, TSN moment. That's me. right. Yep. That's, that's a great, that's a great loving spouse, thing from right? your wife. Yep. Great spouse to kind of hold your hand. I know. Yeah. It's how terrible you poor thing. And they shouldn't have done this and all of that. But you got to pull your finger out and get to work. Yeah. It's so, time to man up. And I did. And on that Monday morning, I went in and I, instead of trying to make scenes work, I just add, like the first scene I did that day, I ad lived everything. I ad lived, I rewrote it, I did everything. I said, I'm not doing any of the dialogue. I was like, I just sort of took over in a way, like I was forced to, because I felt like I was fighting for my life. By the way, that's something I've, I've got. I'm a pretty nice guy, but if you back me into a corner, you're going to see the Wolverine in me. That's def I definitely have that, and it's appeared. Uh, I've sort of got off track a bit, but I just felt I, I owed you a bit of an explanation of yeah, that yeah. first one. So I felt, in a way, even closer to the character because of that situation than. It was clear to me that people, it was clear to me. I was getting calls from the studio. You could just feel when things are turning around. When you're in a position, you're on set and they're not loving what you're doing, 
it's like you've got a bad smell. People just away. You're not getting invited to the drink up the thing, and the, you can just feel mm. there's a jockeying for. Oh, don't get close. So he's a nice guy, that guy Hugh, but and then you feel them coming towards you, right? And I'm getting calls, so I knew that things were turning around. I had no idea what would happen to the film at all. The success of it, no one knew that. That was that was a bit of a, uh, a shock to everybody, I think. But over the years, my affection just got deeper and deeper. And by the way, people, I remember people saying to me, like, "Are oh, you doing another one? Like, doesn't it get boring?" I mean, like, all I wanted to say was like, "This character couldn't be further from me," and it's like. Imagine you went to the gym, you got yourself into a greater shape, and then you didn't go to that gym for two years. And then all of a sudden said, right, we're back in the gym again. And you're like, oh, how do, how do you do it again? Or, or, it was always like that. And I always had this feeling from the first one. I was reading the Japanese saga. Yeah, the yeah. first one, I'm like, this is, this is the story we're going to tell. And, you know, I just didn't really have a say in it. And so by the time we got to the last one where I had a say, I was – I was really adamant about what we were going to do. And I'd always felt like I'd let the character down a little bit, if that makes sense. How so? There was more to the character. And I could easily rationalize that in an X-Men movie because you're one of, I mean, he's one of the more popular characters, but you're still one of 12 characters. And on any level, if you're the writer, you've got 120 minutes, you've got 12 characters you just don't, you may have three scenes for your character. And, and was, was prior to Logan was origins probably the one that most featured you? Would that be right? Cause you X-Men were, I mean, origins, yeah. Origins was, Wolverine. was what? Oh nine origins. Yeah. Yeah. Which was unbelievable. Like, I mean, I've probably only seen it 51 or 52 times, but <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, the, <laughs> it's, it's just unbelievable. I still then felt frustrated that we hadn't got, to the core of who this character i just mm. really felt there was a deeper story to tell and there was resistance for sure not amongst the key people at fox to be honest you know the key people were like let's go for it but then it was like oh, if we go r rated it's probably 100 million we're leaving on the table you know we've spent all these years building it and then i said gotta call it logan because this is actually about more the human being than super uh, uh no like we've spent 17 years building a brand yeah, Harley Davidson's Harley Davidson. You don't all of a sudden call the Harley Davidson Terry. Like, that's a Harley. So that we need Wolverine on the post. And I said, and me and Jim were like, no. And and again, they went with it. There's a lot of bold steps. And I, I guess that's why I was super proud of it because I knew it was going to be my last one. Mm. I, I, I had... I know that, and it just it just kills me to hear you say it still. I know that's <laughs> true, and it upsets me so much. <laughs> I didn't want to have any regrets about it. I didn't want to have any sort of, because I, then I would be doing another one, yeah. um, probably, because I wouldn't be able to lose myself. You know, so I, I just, going back to your original question, I just still pinch myself that I got to play such a great role, that I feel at peace with it, that I got to do it in nine different movies, that anyone who knows me from anything just knows that, if they knew me before I went for the audition for Wolverine, I wasn't getting the part. Like it's not so. It was felt it, it, in every way. It just felt like a great when like, Patrick great, when, 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 when Patrick dies. Uh, I mean, when Professor dies, of course. I mean, first of all, that is to me one of the most startling scenes in the movie that you just don't expect. You, you know, right. and what's so heartbreaking about it is how he doesn't realize it's. He, he thinks it's Logan, right? And, um, y- you know, I, I don't, uh, how, yeah. how that, deliberate was that? Very, that was very deliberate. And I, I, that's where like the writers and Jim Mangold, they, they just made so many decisions. I was just immediately so proud of but when, when I watched, first of all, Patrick was incredible. That scene prior to him dying, he does that monologue, oh. which is, admitting his failures and faults and his regrets and live it's not too late for you live i know live i know you can live like it's so beautiful beautifully written incredible his affection for your daughter is is unbelievable and he's basically trying to give you this one last chance to make it all right and then 
I, you know, I, I remember sitting next to Patrick Stewart and Jim Mangold, the writer director, who I've done three movies with, is one of my closest friends in Berlin. So we go to the Berlin Film Festival, which I wrote down on a sheet of papers. This is the type of movie that will premiere in Berlin, like film, film. This is going to be seen as a film, not a superhero movie, but a film about a real character. So we're sitting there and that scene where, and Jim just directed this so well. I obviously wasn't there because my character's in the grave, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen. But where she walks up, all the other kids walk off. They've done the funeral. And she walks up to the X, the two sticks that have been put in the thing. She just takes it out tips it over onto its side into an X. I, I could get emotional. I could cry now just thinking about it. I just weeping. It was so, because in many ways, going back to like, telling you about my upbringing, that idea of this is how you were taught. And I was taught when I was a kid, this is religion. And at some point you have to become your own man. And Wolverine was always his own man, but actually he wasn't really an insider. In the end, he was an X-Men. Like he really was the epitome of what X. I I thought the poetry in that moment, I, I, and we didn't know if we were going to kill Wolverine or not when we started it. Really, of course, it was a discussion, mm. and, and we all said unless we earn that moment, then it's a stunt. It's just like oh, it's one, and it'll piss people off if we get it right. It was that feeling that I had in that cinema where I was just whoa, and I remember just grabbing Jim's, like put my hands on their legs and I turned to Patrick and he was just crying. And, you know, we, we realized it was 17 years and, and such a gift in our business where you go in, you meet people, you become super close three months later. See you later. It's a really odd kind of business in that way. Um, was there, I don't know if you remember this. Actually, it was at Darren's birthday, Darren's 50th birthday. You and I were sitting next to each other and we were talking about the last scene of Logan because I had recently rewatched it. Um, and I sheepishly admitted, I was like, you're not going to believe this brother. But the first time I watched this, when Logan says, this is what it feels like, I thought he was talking about death. Right. I just, you know, and then of course, the second time I actually understood what he meant. Has right. anyone else ever said that to you? Has anyone ever? Oh, all the time. Really? All the time. That's a, Jim wrote that line. I think it was Jim. I don't think it was Scott, but I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was Jim. I, when I read that, I was just like, I thought the same thing because the ultimate, when I first read it, I thought, oh, the person who's immortal, effectively immortal and yet unhappy with life like is, is must speak to you as someone who deals with longevity what's the point of being around forever if you've got so much pain and lack of understanding where it comes from that moment oh this is what it feels like he, he in the whole movie you get a feeling of someone who almost wants it to come like please take me out of my misery please 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 but then it wasn't until we were doing it and playing the scene Oh, no, it was before that. When we talked about it, I realized there's such a dual meaning to this. And people are going to take it in different ways. Again, that's what Jim, Jim Mangold always says to me. He goes, don't, in a movie, don't tell me one plus one equals two. Like, that's science. Tell me, in, one, in science, I want to know one plus one equals two. But in art, tell me one plus one equals three and then spend the movie proving it to me. It's like, make me go, what? And, and an end line like that, is it's just such a great example of one plus one equals three. It can work yeah. on both things. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com dot com forward slash about 
where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies. 